Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. I'm excited today. We have a special guest, been in the real estate space for 20, 30 years at this point, created Harvard Grace Capital, I believe, basically a syndication that just in 2021, they've taken down three deals already as a group. 4.1 4.1 million, 11 million, 2 million recently, and really focusing on more commercial space, not necessarily multifamily, but doctors, offices, storage, buildings, and so forth. And obviously, it's, it's a hold play for strategy as well. I'm sure cost segregation as well for the depreciation and so forth. And, and yeah, this is awesome because it's in Huntsville, Alabama. And there's been a lot of growth in the last few years for Huntsville, Alabama and the outside skirts. So we're going to deep dive on location today, on why that area, on just the strategic type of play and, and how these guys are getting these big deals and so forth and how you guys can really do it too. So this is going to be an awesome episode. I'm excited to have you on here today, Stuart. How are you? I'm doing great. Really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, likewise. So talk to us. Anybody out there that doesn't know who you are, where you're from, giving us that 30,000 foot view, do you mind? Sure. No, not at all. Stuart Heath, I'm located in Middle Tennessee. I grew up south of Nashville. I live in Fayetteville, Tennessee right now, which is real close to the Huntsville, Alabama market that you were just talking about. Been a CPA for a long time. I've um, helped clients with a lot of real estate. I've done it myself and then just sort of formalized wanting to do bigger deals via syndications here a few years ago with Harvard Grace Capital. Mm. Okay, nice. And then so how many people are on the team currently? We have three full-time people on the team and we have a board that is as active as they need to be, which is fairly active. Yeah. (laughs) So talk to me, why did you put this board together? Why you guys were doing individually, everybody on the board was kind of doing real estate by themselves for a long period of time, correct? Yeah, everybody has been in different facets. A lot of them would just own, um, you know, single family homes. Uh, others have had, you know, one of my board members used to work with Sam Zell, who just passed away, who's a real estate legend from the equity yeah. companies. And so he brings a whole different perspective to things. And other guys have just, one of them is a wealth manager who also loves real estate. And the fourth guy is a guy I actually used to work for. And he was in the media business, but we are, were always talking about real estate and he would do some. And, and, and so he and he has a great vision and, and wanted to bring him on. Always, you know, just people that I've known for a long time who have a different perspective and different uh, experiences uh, and who've been a huge value add to me as, as I've tried to drive this venture forward. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I didn't know about Sam Zell. I've seen him in the past. Passed away last week, actually. So. Really? I didn't know that. That's very sad. He was uh, literally such a legend. I think what yeah. billions of I would always was. make sure I would be watching CNBC. Yeah. 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 In- incredible, uh, just visionary. And what a mastermind at real estate investing, you know? Yeah. Like, so, wow. Yeah. Paul Great. Lucking, who's my board member who used to work with Sam, we were talking this morning about. Uh, Sam was a pioneer in the landlords providing phone and internet back in mm. the, you know when internet was first coming out. And of course, you just can't run any cable you want to into your suite. Somebody else, you know, and he jumped on it immediately and sort of pioneered that for landlords being in essentially in the telecoms business for their building and it becoming a huge money maker for their assets. So one of the board members, one of your friends used to work side by side with him. It's been a long time. I don't know that they were partners or side by side, but he knows Sam and knew Sam and they worked together. So he, I think he headed up one of Sam's divisions for him. Mm. Okay. Love it. Okay. So talk to us. First off, the strategy, like why you guys were doing, 
I assume, so I don't want to assume anything, but when you guys were broken off individually, what type of real estate were you guys focusing on then? Was it residential? Yeah, mainly we were doing single family homes. Sure. I've dabbled in some condos and some townhomes from time to time. And yeah, these are nice assets and they can make some money. I've always tried to do things at scale. And if you're going to make real money in single family home business, typically you need to manage that yourself. I apologize to all the property managers out there, but you'll get great capital gains when you might have third party manager, but uh, you're going to eat into your cash flow it, mm -hmm. unless you're managing it yourself. So it's hard to do that at scale in the single family home. At one point in my past career, I had over 200 personal residential units. And it, yeah, as I've described it, that's... Uh, that is my definition of hell. So yeah. I even had a team and, and, you know, I actually bought a property management company that came with 100 units. And then I added my 200 units and it's like, oh, well, that solved the problem right now. I didn't solve anything. I'm not a big fan of residential management. It is a lot of, it's a lot of customer service, which takes a lot of time and, and effort. I think that residential, especially multifamily, is sort of the core real estate investment. So I'm certainly not against that. Uh, but what we like to do is follow those trends with asset classes that correlate very directly to multifamily. Yeah, good. I love it. Okay. So individually, you guys were all doing more residential stuff. And then together as a team, you guys wanted to start focusing on more, you know, bigger commercial. So why that? Like why just because of the the past experience and the headache, more residential and and all that stuff, you wanted to go a little bit bigger with more of a team? Yeah, more more of a team. You know, when you combine efforts and you bring in other people's capital, then then everybody gets to leverage on the bigger asset. So our first deal that we did was a suburban office building in Spring Hill, Tennessee, which is southern middle Tennessee, as we discussed. It's a building that had belonged to one of my clients. They needed to sell it. I had been managing it for them for several years. And so we came to terms and it's roughly a $4 million deal. And so for the exact same effort, we could be putting into managing two or three houses or whatever. And the capital, you know, we get to uh, supply that labor and manage the asset of a $4 million asset rather than you know, then for $200,000 assets or 200, you know, that kind of thing. And some of it is in truth, a lifestyle choice. I enjoy personally dealing with business tenants a lot more than I do residential tenants. Uh, there is the, you get the real recurring income. There's recurring income in multifamily, but in commercial, you typically are doing three to five year leases. So you sell it once and then it sort of clicks along again for five years. And, and um, then those tenants generally have needs and there's other income opportunities along the way. Are, are these triple net leases as well? Most of them are modified gross. But so with a cam that we can build them back for increases in insurance and taxes and utilities and things like that. Most of them are paying their utilities directly. Sure. Okay. And then there's a CAM component, a common area maintenance factor component that's measured off of a base year. Okay. That you guys are responsible for. Yes. Yeah. We pay it. And then every year we owe them a report on what that is and build them accordingly. Because, you know, people who just did their lease with us last year, they will have a 2022 base year. So they won't have any CAM, but they might for 2023. For sure. Okay. Love that. And then the location. Talk to me about the location out of yeah. all the states nationwide. Why like Huntsville, Alabama location? Tell me Huntsville something very, I don't know. I want yeah. to get to the... Sure. Like, where, well, I, I don't know what you do know, but Huntsville is a very unique place. Yeah. And for a long time, they have boasted the highest number of PhDs per capita than any other city in the nation. So, you, I mean, I would have always thought that would have gone to some college town or whatnot. But, you know, and most of them literally are rocket scientists and, and things of that nature. But, you know, the FBI is rebuilding their Quantico Training Academy in Huntsville. And uh, I know several people who are constructing those buildings. I mean, they're bringing 4,000 people uh, to the Redstone Arsenal. Huntsville has more than doubled in size in the last 10 years. A lot of that began with the Army relocating three commands from around the country 
to the Huntsville, to Huntsville's Redstone Arsenal. One of those commands was the Army Procurement Command. So anything the Army buys goes through Huntsville now, at mm -hmm. least digitally or by paper. That brought a whole lot of people. And when you bring people, that brings housing, it brings car sales, it brings retail, apartments, it just ripples. And so Huntsville's, I can rattle off a dozen different things that have happened in Huntsville like that. It's not just the FBI, it's the CIA, it's the NSA, it's a Toyota Mazda joint venture that opened last year where they're making engines together uh, for, for their various cars. And they've hired 10,000 people, you know, and that is in Huntsville. And generally, you know, I don't know if anybody reads U.S. News and World Report, but uh, Huntsville was the number two nicest places to live this year. That's down one. Last year, they were number one. Somehow we got beat out by um, Green Bay. Green Bay. <laughs> I'm like, don't they know how cold it gets up there? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a very nice place to live. It's a very yeah. upscale. Now, what makes Huntsville unique and different than some of the other places like Texas and Atlanta and Florida that people are also migrating to is Huntsville's migration is in very much a large part a very highly educated migration, more so than other people who are just, quote, fleeing California, which I'm not sure. I'd... Yes, I know there's a migration happening, but I don't think it's going to be the end of California by, by any stretch of imagination. But uh, I still live in California. I'm not going anywhere. I love the yeah. place. I'm really? It's Jersey a beautiful Jersey. state. It's yeah. a beautiful state. From New Jersey um, originally, so I can be like, not that everything's better than there, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you living in Huntsville? I live in Tennessee, just above Huntsville. I'm about 15 okay. minutes out. So, Stuart, um, quick question. So, for yeah. locations as an educational piece, on you know, to some of the listeners, where can they go to find some of these details? Because when I'm figuring out a location, I always look for three things I'm looking for job growth population growth, and then something unique. You mentioned a dozen things that are unique, plus the job growth, population growth, like all of that as itself is the trending factor of why somebody should start looking to invest over there. You know, you yeah. really want to ride the wave, not jump yep. in when it's Correct. already happening or it's been happening. But talk to me, where can somebody find that next state, that next location that's starting to get that wave? Well, I always like to go to sort of original source. So, uh, and it's boring work. But if you want to find out the next wave, then typically you need to spend some time in you know the government data uh, reports that they put out regularly and spend time with them. Look at trends and charts. Department of Labor, you know, our government puts out unbelievable amounts of data, and most of us hear about headline reports that are issued. You know unemployment, you know, uh, jobless claims and stuff like that. We hear about that and then go on. But most of us have no idea how much data there is in there. So I would start by if anybody, if you want, jobs is always a, uh, is a good factor. Go and find the states and cities who have unemployment less than the national average. Look mm -hmm. at that. And even in a time of high inflation, look at their unemployment rate. I mean, unemployment in Huntsville is is in the two percent range. You, you know, it's that's unnatural, and it's you're never going to have zero percent because yeah. there's always there's always transition. So you used to be you know, we thought four percent was full employment in this country, and so in Huntsville, they pull people out of Tennessee to work down there all the time. It, so. Um, it's, and when you look at that rate, you're looking at people who live in that city. And you don't really, you sort of have to dig down and talk to people to find out how many workers they're pulling from other geographies as well. So I, yeah. I, I like to start in the government data to answer your question. Yeah, I love that. Certain other places that I've come to find that have been decent as like citydata.com or, or usa.com, you know, little things like that, or even just looking at the crime rate and certain things in in your location but of course just like you mentioned you know really looking for that that unemployment rate right and, and trying to find something lower than the national average especially in today's times and so forth so finding that next coming location and trying to ride that and establishing something while 
before everybody else kind of gets there is the the key to it. That's the secret yeah. ingredient because yeah. you can ride the wave and get that exponential growth. Yeah. Um, not saying that, you know, in the next few years, it's probably still going to be amazing for, for Huntsville, Alabama. It's only starting to, you know, where do you think you are on that chart right now? Honestly, I think we're in the, um, the first third of the wave. Sure. I think there are, there are many years to go here. I'm an old guy. And Huntsville reminds me of Nashville 30 years ago. Sure. And the main reason we're focused on Huntsville is uh, w- we live here. We know this market. And because we property manage everything that we sponsor, w- you know, one of our rules is we, w- you know, we're not going to do any property we can't get to within an hour. Yeah. But I mean, our, our view is we're just in the beginning of this before it settles out. And we, we tend to be cash flow investors. The, the deals we bring to market will generally cash flow for the investor from day one. So they're stabilized assets and, you know, stabilized should stay stabilized for 20, 25 years. And just because you might not get the wave of the first run up of values doesn't mean you, you can't get a very nice IRR and cash return, cash and cash return later on. That said, we do expect that, you know, uh, you know, there's. 14,658 apartment units under construction in Huntsville right now. And so Just as a couple, we, huh? Just a yeah, couple. It, it's a few. I mean, the, the yeah. sort of put a, not an official, but put a halt on it. Says, Just wait a second, guys. Yeah, slow it down, boys. <laughs> yeah, and, and most of those people aren't even in town yet. Mm. You know, but they're we know from, they're getting ready for it. Most of those will be finished this year. Uh, and be on the market, and many of them are pre-leased. So those are brand new properties. So do you think the supply and demand right there for the quality of product now is going to potentially make some kind of ripple in the market? You know, just like you were saying, when it comes down to the market in general, you don't need to be necessarily a rocket science either to to jump into real estate. The longer you hold, the more money it's going to make. So yes. if you can hang on to it for another 5, 10, 15, 20 years, don't worry, it's going to do okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And during that time, you will have refinanced it two, three, maybe four times. Sure. Pull out that cash on a tax-free basis and keep on rolling. Yeah. Uh, which put it gives to work. You, yeah, and yeah. Which gives you a chance to um, put it in other properties for sure. I mean... Now... Going back to that question, though, when it, when it comes down to these new products, do you think anything will potentially have a ripple effect because they are overbuilding in the location at the moment? I know that will catch up probably within the next year or yeah. so. I think what will happen is that there will be some people moving out of older properties into newer properties, and that's going to create an opportunity for the value add in the multifamily space, which is nearly impossible to find a deal in, yeah. in that realm right now. So it might, you know, although the current projection is that Huntsville will um, absorb every one of those units by the end of 23, I think it's probably more like the half, first half of 23. And it's not just apartment units, it's, you know, single family homes and where there, there is no a lot inventory available. You know, the, the big track builders come in and buy the land, develop it themselves. And, um, just like you said, though, like as it's getting pre-leased, it's like, well, it, it just shows that it's getting soaked up right as it's available anyway. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, but there are always opportunities. Real estate is so vast and so wide. You know, you have to, as a friend of mine used to say, you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the property that turns into the prince. And you know, it, it takes a lot of you know shoe leather, as they used to say, you got to talk yeah. about before you find the deal. I mean, the deal we closed yesterday, I've been talking to the owner since before Thanksgiving. And, yeah. And he had to come to realize what his property was worth. Yeah. Sure. And he did, and we did a deal. So there, you got to get out and talk to a lot of people. I love that. I want to talk about some of these deals, but before we do so, when it comes down to stabilizing, you're saying that these are cash flow day one, the properties that you guys go after. So they are already stabilized. Yes. So these are B class or A class right away, or is there any type of value add that you guys are pushing onto the properties? Yeah, for in the case of our uh, suburban office building in Spring Hill, 
Which one was that? Was that one, two, or three? Was that? That was number one. That was number okay, one. The four, four, four million dollar deal. Okay. So we were able to reclaim some space that the seller had just used as storage, Neglected. and and we turned that into just storage space into a uh, a revenue generating tenant, and that let us move a lot of things around step up rents in every case. So, you know, our, our rent income will be up about 10% uh, in 18 months. Uh, we're just about to finish all that construction this month. And so I would say the value add in that case would be management. While I was managing it for my client before, they didn't want to do it. So, um, yeah. Well, it's uh, a creative so spin to it, right? It's it's yeah. seeing outside the box and like yeah. totally taking full advantage of what is already there. You don't need to be a rocket science. You just look at what's there and, you know, take away the cobwebs, move away the clutter. And then you you look at it. And exactly like, right. Oh, we, we could rent yeah. this out, you know? Yeah. yeah. Also, at that same property, we had somebody come to us. We weren't just putting on our radar. It's just they wanted to park their bus. They're a tour group. They're a, they're a band. Sure. To park their bus there. And it turns out we had a bus pad there that used to belong to one of the tenants. And I never really had thought much about it. So I started looking at this. And, and so then I created three bus pads, you know, at $500 a month, uh, you know, and they've got power and water, which is um, more than they can typically get at your general, at your place where that's actually advertising that business. And, sure. and it's 150 bucks less. And, and Spring Hill is an area where there's none of that kind of stuff available. So they were having to drive 20 miles to their bus. So, so over delivering on the product too, giving the people what they yeah. truly need when yeah. no one else is. So that's great. Yeah. Exactly. I love it. So is it more of a B class type of? Uh, it's totally a B. It's totally a B class. Yeah. Okay. Location as well, B class. No, the location. It's a very high net worth area in. Um, uh, Murray County, which is just south of Nashville. We are within sight of where GM built their Saturn plant 30 years ago and where they're building their EV assembly plant and their EV battery plant right now. So it's a small community that was sort of brought into modern day existence by General Motors uh, in the 80s. But it's a very high net worth community and land has been at a premium. But that building is, there's not another building like it in, in, in a three mile radius. Love uh, it. And that area just keeps growing and growing. And if I had another one, I could keep that one full too. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah, I actually have somebody that I've mentored for a while now. He bought his very first property with no knowledge, just that me educating him in his first three weeks, he got lucky and blessed in so many ways in his first three weeks he got a property three thousand miles away over in huntsville alabama oh wow and yeah he, he's done the burr strategy he's refinanced it twice pulled out a bunch of money each time it just keeps going up the him. last five years good for and, him and so well, if you ever um, somebody put eyes on it just tell him give me a call i'll be happy to yeah. take a look at it for him so yeah appreciate that okay so talk to me how are you getting these leads like you said, you got to uh, look at a lot of frogs or kiss a lot of frogs till you find your prints. So what, how many deals, where are you finding them? And what does that look like, the KPI wise? Like how many are you actually analyzing before you take one down? Full analysis, uh, probably analyzing five before we move to even make an offer on one. That's sure. we, get about, we get about half of our offers accepted. To get to the five, we're probably taking a good hard look at 20 and good hard look means I'll actually get in the car and go see it. Yeah. I look at a lot and the sources of these are, you know, the more deals you do, the more people, you know, I have banks sending me deals. Nice. Um, What's uh, and, and mainly community banks, but that was a strategy we started last year because, you know, it's in the news again today. We know things, as soon as the interest rates started going up, we knew that that's going to present a problem for some people. And so the people that will know about that first will be the bankers. So I'm constantly networking with bankers and say, this is who we are. This is what we do. If you've got somebody who can't refinance or wants to sell their property, let them talk to us. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, that means we might just take over their note with the bank. The bank doesn't lose the, lose the credit or it might just be a sale. I've what only had one bank actually send me a lead like that, but we still 
keep in touch with them. Brokers is a major. And which of which bank is that? That was Merritt Bank. But uh, I mean, we, we've got thirty on our list that we're networking. Nice. Okay. And then obviously a ton of brokers. Are you working with wholesalers as well? I haven't worked with any wholesalers. Not opposed to it. Uh, they typically want to do a deal a lot faster than we want to do a deal. And we're sure. we're pretty slow and methodical. And then I, you know, I subscribe to CoStar and Crexy, and I routinely just start looking at stuff. I find stuff that my brokers haven't even heard about. Yeah. What are those websites? I, I actually haven't heard of those. CoStar, CoStarGroup.com. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of the commercial MLS. Yeah. And Crexy, C R E X I, they're a little newer. Uh, but generally, brokers should be putting their listings in both of those. They're both subscription services. So I do pay for those, but it's not, there is a cost to being in the business and trying to get the deals. So. Sure. Yeah, of course. Got to pay to play. Um, you do. Love- yeah, the more deals you do, the more you can pay. <laughs> and honestly, that's okay to me because people that aren't willing to pay and take a little risk and, and put in the work, you know, roll up the sleeves, it just cuts out the BS right away. You know, it's not thousands of dollars to get to some of these things, you know? Yeah. In many cases, you can get away with a lot less. So, for, for sure. Yeah. That's one of the reason I don't particularly care to be involved in residential real estate either. You get a lot of um, non professionals. Yeah. Know, and, and they can muck up the market for it then. So. Yeah. That's true. Cool. Talk to me uh, about. The funding things. How are you guys funding right now? You guys are raising capital. I assume with your background in accounting and so forth, being a CPA, you get to see a lot of books, you get to see a lot of numbers. So you get to talk to a lot yeah. of professionals and say, hey, I see you did well this year. You should consider somebody. Yeah. yeah, for sure. A lot of our investors have come from clients and or people that I've done business with for, for 30 years. So right. at the end of the day, a lot of this comes back to network, network, network. But half the time, those guys have brought somebody else with them. And so it becomes a new relationship for us. And that's happened on every deal that we've done. I love that. For the most, for the most part, all of our investors have reinvested in our next deal, which is hugely complimentary. And then they bring a friend. You yeah. Know, so it, it's like um, traditional stuff. But But we're very actively... Seeking out new relationships by doing things like podcasts, by offering resources online, asking people to join our list, and networking on LinkedIn and stuff as well. So uh, we're actively trying to expand our network. I love it, Stuart. Talk to us when it comes down to the future. Like, what is it? What does the end goal look like for you guys? Where are you taking this in the next few years? In the next few years, I think what we have just internally discussed that. As Harvard Grace Capital, what we would like to do is to do 10 individual deals. So, you know, everything we've done right now is a single asset entity and investors have invested directly in that entity. We want to get 10 of those going, uh, call that 50 million in assets under management. You know, um, we'll probably be 20 million under, under management by the end of Q3. And so, so 50 million may be a little. Oh, low. A little low. Yeah, I think um, you're going to hit that pretty soon. <laughs> and, and that's okay. I mean, it's just yeah. a number. That's not really our, it, you know, right. it's a vanity metric. And once we get 10, what we'd really like to do is to do a fund that yeah. we are discussing internally. You know, we've got this trillion dollars of real estate notes coming due this fall. I do believe that there's going to be a generational opportunity for the next year or 18 months. Uh, so do we do the fund now? And so we're talking with investors about that. Uh, just and the only reason you do you do a fund is to move faster. Yeah, of course. And so you go out buy it and then put put the bank leverage on it. And once you've secured the great deal, and a lot of a lot of securing great deals is speed. Mm. Uh, your, your ability to move fast. So um, we don't have the ability to go really fast right now. Not that that's really our mo, but when there's some. Um, people melting down and some great assets on the block, uh, you know, it would be, it would be helpful to go really fast. Yeah. So you're answering a little bit of my next question. Uh, Oh, sorry. (laughs) Well, no, no, it's great. I love it. I just want to dive a little bit deeper. 
you know, what are your thoughts about the future when it comes down to the market that we're in and just the craziness that's out there? Nobody's got that crystal ball, ladies and gentlemen, so we won't hold it to you, Stuart. But, (laughs) you know, when it comes down to your experience, you've seen 2008, 2009, you've been through that, right? And that was catastrophic for way too many. And we learned from that, right? But have we really learned is what I guess the the next season that might be coming up, the next chapter of the market. So what yeah. what are your thoughts about where we're currently at and what does that look like in the next year or two? Well, I think it is interesting. I think where we're at doesn't look anything like any place we've been before. You know, people have been screaming recession since last summer. I didn't realize till last summer that they somebody had changed the definition of a recession. I thought that was uh, two consecutive corners. It's like, really? When did that change? So I, yeah. and, and, I, and last fall kind of felt like a recession to me. Then again, it's a recession with uh, nearly full employment. You know, and here's the problem is the economy is always spoken in terms of nationally and financing rates and things like that are generally talked about on a national level. But all real estate is local. So I am not convinced that there's going to be this great generational wave of opportunity in our target area because the economy is so strong. There still may be a few people who didn't manage their property right and can't afford you know, 5% more in their mortgage rate uh, than they had when they locked it in you know, five years before. There's going to be some of those. But I think the most pain is going to be in some of the larger cities in central business districts, the class A properties in central business districts. I don't think there's going to be a lot of multifamily properties in trouble. Yes, there was one in the news a month ago down in Texas. And that to me had more to do with their floating rate financing than it did the asset class. Well, I I think there's a lot of those potentially out there. I think there Mm -hmm. could be more people that weren't buying the insurance policy, basically, and assuming to to compete with those rates for for investors. Yeah, Yeah. and and that's a reason I've stayed away from that because I was watching deals in Nashville, multifamily deals that were selling for a three and a half cap rate. And their projections were saying rents were going to go up 12% a year for the next five years. I said, guys, I cannot put that on paper. Yeah. I cannot put that on paper. And rents, what have rents done? They've slowed yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. They're still high. Yeah. You know, but their growth rate is down to 3%. And so, yeah, there's a lot of those deals that are going to have to get recapitalized. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, when I say a meltdown, I'm talking foreclosure. There's a lot of deals that are going to get recapitalized and some partners are going to get squeezed out and stuff like For that. Sure. And a lot of those deals are going to be a much higher plane. Those are several hundred million dollar type transactions and and I'm down here paying playing in the 25 million and under range which is a a different market and and a lot of the big guys don't like to play in that range Mm -hmm. but get back to the question there's going to be some pain there's already been some pain we've had three bank failures but this this whole thing doesn't look anything like anything we've seen before generally you got job losses those may come yeah those may come but every, right now, everybody's still employed, and for the most part, they are spending at a very healthy rate. Well, we've seen the tech space in Silicon Valley and so forth. You know, their employment, a lot of tech industry individuals are, are getting laid off. So, you know, not all areas nationwide are that unemployment right. start. You know, it, it may start fluctuating a little bit. And there's, you know, the three banks that did fail. Um, it's unbelievable how the well, the banks or the government has to bail them out or else the ripple effect of how far and how deep it will go, it would be catastrophic. But on top of that, there's like about 300 other banks that people aren't aware of that are right on that border edge. So only. only oh, I think there's more bank pain coming for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Well, yeah. I appreciate your time greatly today. Um, oh. How can people get a hold of you? The best place to get up with me is harvardgracecapital.com. Uh, you can find my Calendly link if you'd like to talk with me. You can uh, go to the resources section and get resources. We've got checklists for passive investors, as and, and we're constantly updating that. You know, so check back often. Join our mailing list. Find out about our deals. But uh, anybody who wants to chat with me, don't hesitate. Just use that link and 
I'll talk to anybody anytime about real estate. I love that. I love that. Well, Stuart, you are a wealth of knowledge, my friend. I appreciate you greatly for your time today. And uh, anybody that is listening to this, please reach out to Stuart. He is a wealth of knowledge, like I said, and definitely network and, and be able to potentially help yourself out with going to your next level in real estate. And I hope you found a tremendous amount of value in this. As always, make sure you hit that subscribe button. You'll get the newest notification every Monday. Leave that five-star review. As always, greatly appreciated. If you guys want to get a hold of me, you can always do so on Instagram. It is Brandon Elliott Investments. Otherwise, facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. And then if you are looking to get up to $500,000 every six months at 0% interest, that's right. I did not did not butcher that at all. It is 0% interest. We can teach you how to do so at creditcouncilelite.com. That's www.creditcouncilelite.com. There's a quick 10-minute video on there that explains more. And afterwards, you can sit down with either myself or somebody on our team to be able to go over more of your situation, your goals, and how we can get you there sooner. And just take a second opinion overall. But we can show you how to get a big stack from the banks so that you can leverage it into real estate like we have or grow and scale your business. So uh, with that being said, appreciate you guys. As always, we will see you on the very next episode. Until next time, guys, God bless. And Stuart, appreciate you so much. Great episode. Thank you, today. Brandon. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.